my knits took up the vast majority of my suitcase. This feels like a gamble. Like, am I gonna regret this? I am so glad that I did. Hello, my name is Allie, and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going, and what it's costing me. Thank you so much for being here. I wanna talk about how my knits were kind of the heroes of the trip that I was just on. I feel like our knits get a lot of attention like while we're knitting them and when we've just finished them. And maybe they at some point make it into a sort of like reviewing everything I've ever knit video if they're lucky. But outside of that, we don't tend to see or talk a lot about them in the aftermath of them being finished. And since one of the kind of main things that I like to think about for my knits is not only what they're costing me, but sort of how that works out to a larger sense of the value that I've gotten out of them, I think that it's interesting to think about how much wear I have or haven't gotten out of things and why that might be and how that can inform the next things that I choose to knit in hopes of getting the best possible use out of those also. Because for me, like knitting is definitely a creative thing and I do like doing it for its own sake, but I also really want the thing that I've produced in the end to actually be practical. Like for me, knitting is kind of equal parts both. Of course, some projects will like tip more one way or the other, but I really do care about both of these things most of the time. So it was really interesting to me to see how my knits played on this recent trip and how genuinely like critically important and useful they actually were. Now this intro is coming to you from like a future timeline of the footage that you're about to see because this was originally just supposed to be part of my regular format knitting podcast episode that went up recently um, and I finished filming and I looked at the time and I was like well that's funny it's 2 30. I could have sworn I started filming at 11. No, I did start filming at 11 and I did in fact have three and a half hours of footage on my camera. So I did my best. I edited it down and even trimming as much as I could possibly come up with the trim, I was still at an hour and 35 minutes. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think that that is what very many people want. I won't say anyone because I do know that like if my favorite knitting podcast were to drop an hour and a half long episode, I would be so ready. I'd be like, let me grab my knits, let me make a tea, let us settle in. This is going to be the evening of dreams. So if that is you and that is how you feel, just know I see you, I am you, I love you. But for the greater good, I made the decision to split this into two videos. <laughs> so we're first gonna go over acquisitions because I also cut that from the regular episode because the acquisitions are also very trip related. So we're gonna do acquisitions and then I'm gonna show you some trip pictures featuring my knits. And we're gonna talk about how I think that I would have been a lot less comfortable on this trip if I hadn't had my knits. So let's get into it. Because I was in Italy, I have some fun acquisitions. So when I was in Venice, it hadn't even occurred to me beforehand. I was literally there and I was like, wait a minute, is there a yarn store here? <laughs> so I Googled it and found that there is a little shop called Lella Bella that seems to be the one yarn store in Venice, or at least the one that I was able to locate traces of. So it happened that on the last day we were there in that morning, my sister's household kind of decided to take it slow. Everybody kind of slept in. And when I woke up, mom was also up and I was like, do you want to come to a yarn store with me? So so we made our way to Lella Bella and it was so cute. I'll put up some pictures. It's this really tiny little store and the, I believe the owner was there. She told me that everything in their store is all Italian yarns. So it's all sourced from within Italy. And they had a lot of really pretty, like variegated yarns. Some of them were cotton, some were wools, some were, there, there were, there were actually some um, plant-based blends that I'd never heard of before. I'm trying to remember were they? It was, it was like fiber from something that I didn't know you could make fiber from. It was news to me. Um, but so lots of interesting different fibers in lots of different, um, really pretty interesting variegations. And there was also a lot of cashmere. Oh, it was, it was so soft. And some of it was very expensive, but because it was like very nice cashmere. So spoiler, I did not leave with the very expensive cashmere. I didn't have anything specific in mind. I was just sort of looking around and thinking like, okay, if I could find like one skein of something that I really love here, and then I can like come up with something to do with it. Now, is it a bad idea for me to buy anything from a yarn store when I don't have a particular project in mind for it? Given the precedent of my Hedgehog's Fiber Swatch, um, yeah, probably. <laughs> but I decided to kind of grant myself the wiggle room here on this one as I'm traveling because it feels like, I don't, it feels like the perfect souvenir, especially that the shop is all Italian yarns. Like it's not just like I'm going to Italy and buying the same knitting for Olive that I'm already using. The idea that I could go to Italy and come home with a ball of Italian yarn that I do something with that then becomes kind of a memento of this trip. 
just really liked that idea. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll cut ourselves some slack. We'll buy some yarn. We'll figure out what to do with it later, eventually. <laughs> And it'll be fine. So I, I looked at a lot of these really beautiful variegated yarns, but again, trying to be realistic, kept in mind that while I tend to find these skeins incredibly beautiful, I do tend to struggle to imagine what I would want to make out of them. So what I actually ended up with for myself are these two balls. So I'll show you close up. It's this mostly black but with some lighter brown that's sort of it's like it's almost like the black is like wrapped around the brown the ball is a little bit squished because packing was tight so this is the brand uh Cessia uh Ulysse yarn and this is 100% wool and I don't see like a like a weight by name on it but it does say um, it's recommending a size seven to eight needle and it's showing that it would be a gauge of 12 rows and I think 10 stitches. I think that's what it's telling me. It's saying 10 M and I'm not sure what stitch is in Italian, but that's the best I can gather, though I'm not sure what the eight is in the middle. Maybe that's saying on an eight, a size eight needle. That's what the gauge would be. I'm not entirely sure, but somewhere, somewhere in that zone. But I was thinking that, um, this is sort of like neutral enough that it will hopefully be easier for me to come up with what to do with it. And part of my thinking in getting two was that I thought maybe a potential use for this could be the um, dog walking gloves that I've talked about maybe wanting to make in the future. I don't, I don't know if this is the right weight of yarn for that that I will want. I do not know. Um, but I thought it was at least, it was the most likely use that I could come up with for it. And okay, if not those, maybe socks, maybe I could make, I couldn't make socks for dad out of just two balls of yarn, but maybe I could for me. I just thought that two was enough to give me some more options and that hopefully I would be able to come up with something good to do with it. And I don't know, I just feel like I've never seen this kind of like multicolor yarn before. I don't know, I think ho hopefully it makes something nice, but even if it doesn't, it makes something that is Venice related to me and that's nice too. <laughs> So we're walking around the store and like I said, there's all of these really pretty variegated things and all these different fun yarns that I love as objects. But when I try to think about what I would translate them into that I would actually wear, I hit a brick wall. But mom kept coming back to this one skein and she kept being like, ooh, it's pretty. Ooh, I like this one. Ooh, I feel like this would make a nice scarf. Ooh. And at first I was sort of like, oh yeah, you should like get back into knitting. She's just mentioned that she has knit before but I don't think ever to a degree that she considered herself like a knitter. So I was sort of like, oh yeah, you should like become a knitter. You should get this yarn, make yourself something. Um, but as it kind of came up, oh, this would be a nice guy. Oh, I was like, okay, may maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm the one who needs to turn it into a scarf. And maybe if I buy this now, you will forget that this happened by say Christmas. So this is the yarn that mom kept drifting toward. So. I will show you close up. It's it's wild. It's like, I don't even know how to explain what materials it is. And in fact, neither does the tag because it just says um, mixed content. <laughs> so this is um, Alp Premier and it says exclusive for Lullabella. So apparently Lullabella is the only place you can get it. So lucky for us, we were there. And it does have the website, um, lullabellavenezia.com. And yeah, it is this um, red and pink and orange and little bits of yellow with, there's some sort of like confetti pieces. There's lots of thicks and thins. There are some that are more ribbony. Like this is the kind of yarn that I would see in a store and be like, I have literally no idea what you would ever do with that. And mom saw it and immediately was like, that would make a really beautiful like loose knit scarf, like a decorative accent scarf. Great, my brain doesn't think that way. <laughs> never would have come up with that but I can I can totally see it like I can see this being made into that kind of scarf and that being the kind of thing that mom would absolutely love to wear which begs the question of whether you have a particular pattern that you would recommend following for this bearing in mind the like wild gauge we have going on this recommends knitting it um on a four to six millimeter needle um but obviously with the amount of thicks and thins like what even is gauge? What amount of closed or open are we even going for? Like, I think that for it to look 
deliberate it probably needs to be a deliberately quite open gauge like sort of lacy look but without being actual lace maybe and in a way I'm like okay well I could just start like knitting a rectangle like just knit a scarf and try a few different needle sizes and see what you think but I'm feeling like maybe it would look better if the ends were tapered rather than being like a rectangular scarf end but I also don't think that my mom would like it to be a traditional like semi-circular shawl style but again like I think that a tapered edge would maybe look nicer in this so is there a pattern that you know of that is more of a traditional scarf than a shawl but does some end tapering or maybe it is more of a shawl but it's like less of a semi-circle and more like very elongated like just sort of barely a crescent moon kind of thing you know what I mean if you can think of a pattern that this seems made for please let me know I and mom will both be grateful I'm not actually sure how much each of these balls of yarn cost. I don't think that I still have my receipt with all of them on it, but I can tell you that the total was $65 Canadian, which honestly, I was expecting worse than that. Even when it was rung up at the cash in euros, I think it was maybe like 42 euros or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's it. Like I was braced for worse. I don't know, I guess this is just a reminder that like, yarn tends to be more affordable in Europe. It is just closer to the places that the yarn tends to be coming from and that in North America we tend to be paying a big upcharge for how far that yarn has to travel to us. So that was interesting. So those are my acquisitions. These are my sort of um, Venice souvenirs which are hopefully soon going to, let's upside down, hopefully soon shapeshift into something other than a yarn ball. Stay tuned. <laughs> also speaking of my trip, I want to talk about how I don't know how I would have survived this trip without my knits. My knits featured heavily. So I thought it might be fun to show some pictures of my knits on the trip and kind of talk you through what my experience was in wearing my knits on this trip where I really had to operate with more of a capsule wardrobe style approach in very like difficult weather to plan for in that way. So I and people very close to me have had too many experiences with just absolute baggage nightmares with airlines and flying so I no longer trust them whatsoever so I concluded that for this trip I was going to be doing carry-on only which is not super easy for a 10-day trip to Europe where the weather is questionable so like it was not going to be like warm and sunny the whole time I'm not going to be packing mostly warm weather garments so I decided to pack quite a few of my knits which took up the vast majority of my suitcase space and I was like, this feels like a gamble. Like, am I going to regret this? Is this going to be worth it? And I am so glad that I did. So let me show you. So the first day we were there in Venice was pouring rain and it was cold. So all of the days that we were there, I think the temperature, like the lows and the highs ranged from like around five degrees celsius to around 15 celsius there's note for the americans out there five degrees celsius is 41 fahrenheit and 15 degrees celsius is 59 fahrenheit now you know in my head like 15 doesn't sound that chilly like at home if it was 15 degrees like okay i'm 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 gonna want a jacket because i'm always cold a lot of people wouldn't feel a need for one but it's gonna be fine but venice is a place where it is damp and for me at least, damp cold is like a whole other world from normal cold. Like I would rather be in minus 20 degrees Celsius in a dry cold than zero degrees Celsius in a damp cold because damp cold like gets into your bones in a way that I really struggle to like bounce back from and struggle to not be like miserable. It's not a good time. So part of me was like, Am I being absurd by packing giant wool sweaters to be wearing when it's 15 degrees outside for most of the day? The answer is no, absolutely not. So this first day we were there, we venture out in the morning and I think it's like seven degrees so far and it's raining. So in this picture, you can just barely see my Laura Dugard Intarsia sweater poking through because I am so layered up with this trench coat, with this plaid scarf there's also you can't really see in this picture but there's like a black polyester um pretty thick shell jacket on underneath in between the sweater and the coat and that had me like good like I would not have wanted less than that and like again this is partly a me problem because I'm just always cold partly a climate problem a cold wet problem also, fun fact, I went and looked at my Etsy purchase history for this scarf because I was curious to see 
if the listing was still live and I could figure out whether it had any wool content in it because this wasn't really something that was like on my radar at the time that I bought this. I bought this scarf back in 2015 so wool, knitting, none of this was on my radar. The listing was not there anymore but what I did find was that I bought this scarf from Ozetta. Ozetta of knitting Ozetta. So I had remembered that I had stumbled upon Ozetta years before I ever started knitting because I had been looking on Etsy for wool socks. I just decided this was the thing I would like to own. I wasn't knitting yet. I need someone else to knit them for me. So I stumbled on Ozetta's, but not realizing at first that they were a knitting pattern. I just saw the photos of the socks and I was like, wow, these are beautiful. I would like to buy them. And then I realized they were knitting patterns and not in fact finished objects. And I was sad because they were so beautiful and I wanted them, but I don't knit. And so I've actually been following Ozetta for many years because I just I thought her stuff was pretty. I actually feel like I really need to knit an Ozetta pattern now. I've not done that yet. And I feel like that will be a nice like full circle moment. But what I had completely forgotten was that I guess at that time, Ozetta in her Etsy shop where she now primarily sells her knitting patterns was also selling some things that were not knit related, but she was like making these scarves and selling them. So I just think it's really funny that I'm doing this roundup of like my knits on my trip and then realizing that I was also wearing something that like knitting adjacent on this trip and having absolutely no idea. So thanks Lizetta, it's a lovely scarf and I still wear it all the time. Also shout out to my mom in the back of that picture wearing her um, trash bag poncho. The hat that I'm wearing here is not a hand knit. I bought that at the Strand bookstore in New York last year as a souvenir. I think that's actually the only like knit that I have bought since I started knitting. I granted myself an exception for the strand because who doesn't love the strand? Here you can actually tell that I'm wearing the sweater. This is it at lunchtime at a restaurant eating a lemon tart. And um, this is it when I just want to eat my lemon tart and my mom can't figure out the porch remote on her phone is making me wait a really long time <laughs> while she takes my picture. By far the knit that came in the most handy on this trip was my cable headband. This was such a perfect, like, it's not so cold that I feel like I need to have a toque on or be trapped with a toque all day if it's not cold enough and I don't actually want to be wearing it, but I don't have to worry about my ears being cold. I find there's a weird thing about traveling where I always end up wearing a lot on trips, things that I rarely wear at home. It's like the particular circumstances of being on a trip. Maybe it's that I'm like out and about all day, every day in a way that I'm not when I'm at home or just having to be prepared for very different weather conditions with fewer options. I don't know, I always end up wearing things more on trips that get very little use at home. And this headband is a prime example of that. I almost never wear this headband at home. I wore this one a ton on this trip. Like here is it on the water taxi. Here is it in Burano, the little fishing village with pastel houses off the coast of Venice. Here it is the morning we were going to the yarn store. Here it is on a rooftop overlooking the city of Venice. Here it is with our gelato. Here it is with more gelato. Here it is on a gondola. Like I think I wore this all day for like three days on the trip. It was just the perfect thing to have. Also the yellow sweater that I'm wearing in these is not a hand knit. This is the last knit garment that I bought before I started knitting. It's a sweater from Baba. And it's actually like arguably one of the reasons that I started knitting. Like it was my first experience owning a sweater made of 100% wool. And I was also in the process of trying to come up with like a sort of, sort of use half my brain kind of craft that would do for me what latch hooking did for me as a kid. I was a latch hooking kid, <laughs> but I'm just not big on like what you get when you latch hook. Like that's just not my style. So I was looking for something that would kind of do the same things for me, but produce something that I actually wanted to have in the end. And this sweater was what kind of like answered that for me. It was sort of like, oh, I really love a knit sweater, especially made of wool. Maybe that could be the thing that I learned how to do. So it was sort of like, the start of that. So I did not make it. It is the one sweater that I did not knit that made it onto this trip. So you can see in Venice there's a lot of layering to stay comfortable. You can also see that my niece totally co-opted my strand hat part of the way through this because again we had not really understood just how cold it was gonna feel there. So she stole my hat. I was using the headband a lot. But if I had not had these sweaters I think I would have really struggled in Venice. Despite the fact that like Venice is magical. Like I, I planned this trip with my sister. We each kind of picked a part of Italy we wanted to go to, which is how we ended up going to two places that are nowhere near each other and having to spend all day on the train in the middle. But I had picked Venice, she had picked the Amalfi Coast. So I knew that I suspected I was going to love Venice, but my god, like, I don't know, I feel like usually when you go to a city, you kind of have in your head the pictures of what the city looks like in its like best parts in the like postcardy way. And then maybe like 10 to maybe 25% if you're lucky of the city actually looks like that. 
every corner of Venice looks like a postcard of Venice. Like what I didn't understand until I was in Venice is that like I knew Venice had canals. I knew that's what it was famous for. I didn't realize it only had canals. Like there are not roads, therefore there are not cars. Like there's one like little area like closer to the airport where there are like cars and buses. That's kind of where you get dropped off. But then after that, it's just canals, it's just boats. So there's something so just like romantic and like otherworldly about being in this city that just does not have cars. So it was wonderful. And like, even in spite of the like absolutely garbage weather we had on the first day, like my least favorite weather in the whole world is cold rain. Like I can deal with one or the other just fine, but put them together, that is my absolute least favorite. Our entire first day there was cold rain and it just rained harder and harder as the day went on. And I still had a great time. And honestly, I feel like my nits deserve a lot of the credit for that. So wool is magic, we know that, but like just, it was driven home on a new level in Venice. Also flipping back to this picture to point out that on this day I was wearing my squiggle sweater, which like you cannot really tell in this picture, but it did also make it to Italy. I was wearing it this day that we went to Murano. We, the same day, also went to Murano, which Murano and Murano are two islands that are like very close to each other. And I just, I don't know whose idea that was or why this happened, but that is the case. This was also the same day that we toured the Doge's Palace in St. Mark's Square. So this sweater also got to see a lot of Italy. It was just very layered under a shell jacket and a trench coat. So it did not get to see quite as much of the light of day as the headband did. Now, once we got to the Amalfi Coast, the weather was both the exact same and very different. The exact same in that when we looked at the weather app, like the temperatures, the numbers, the numbers were the same, but like, I cannot even describe to you how different they felt. Like this is where I learned that temperature means absolutely nothing because there were mornings in our rental house in Conca de Marini where the weather app said that it was nine degrees Celsius, but you were at like the face of this cliff like you know where the houses are all stepped down from each other like this so you were on this like cliff face and the sun is beating on you and you are in a light long sleeve t-shirt and you are sweating and again the app says the same thing that it said in venice number wise when i was wearing my thickest wool sweater that laura delgarde sweater and a polyester shell over top of it and long sleeve shirts under it and a trench coat over top of it and I was comfortable. And in Amalfi, comfortable would have been like a t-shirt when we were in the sun. So this is the key factor. And this is where my knits also still came in handy in Amalfi. This was also where just wool's ability to kind of temperature regulate as opposed to like only make you warmer was also helpful. So one day we were there, we went on a walk to try to find the beach. Now, <laughs> This was in our town of Conca de Marini. In Amalfi itself, there were beaches that were open. Conca de Marini, a very small town, and March is the off season. So we basically climbed down a million stairs to be told that the beach was closed for construction <laughs> because it was the off season. So um, on this journey to the closed beach, I wore my Barnes sweater. So this is it, walking down one of the one billion flights of stairs. Also worth noting here, my niece fractured her kneecap five days before our trip. So when you see crutches in the photos, um, that is why. You will also see in some of the pictures, um, sometimes she's using them, sometimes she's not. Over the course of our trip, it was getting better and she was needing to use the crutches less and less. She, she was a champ. We went to like possibly the two most like un- knee injury friendly cities in all of Italy, like both Venice and Amalfi are just all stairs. Amalfi because it's on a giant hill and Venice because since it's all canals, every intersection is a bridge over a canal. It's a miracle that this trip went well and she had a great time and we still got to do lots of stuff. So shout out to my niece. <laughs> and this is my Barnes and sweater again, this time just chilling at our house, which like look at the view. This, this is why we stayed in Conca de Marini rather than staying in Amalfi because for being that much outside of it, we were able to get this like incredible house. It was just so good. So this was, I think, very early morning. So like there's still a little bit of a chill, but the sun is coming out and it was just perfect. I was just very comfortable in my Barnsley sweater. It was a great time. And then here is my classic rib. This was the day we were going into Amalfi and I think this was also the warmest day we'd had yet. So this day I was just wearing the classic rib and my trench coat without shell jacket interventions without things that were thicker than my classic rib because it's one of my thinner knits. I think the high was like maybe 18 degrees Celsius, but then the sun, there's so much sun here. I was like, okay, there's a small chance that I'm gonna regret this, but 
I really didn't like even when there were times where like I probably could have been comfortable wearing like a thinner cotton shirt I wasn't uncomfortable in my wool top either and the parts where we were out of the sun where it was earlier in the day or later in the day and it was cooler I was really glad that I was wearing that so I just was so like what would I even be wearing right now if I didn't have my knits? I don't know, as someone who really has a hard time with like body temperature regulation and staying comfortable, like knitting is the best thing that I ever started doing. I don't know. Here's my classic rib with the best thing that I ate on this entire trip. So this is a lemon gelato sorbet served inside of a giant lemon and if you're not aware, the Amalfi Coast is obsessed with lemons. This is like a big thing that they produce there and it is just everywhere. Like if you go into a tourist shop there, everything is lemon themed. Like they're just lemon lemons. It felt like like when in Rome, except when in Amalfi. When in Amalfi, I'm going to eat this absurd lemon sorbet out of a lemon. And I enjoyed every moment of it. And again, as you can see, it's very sunny here. I've got my sunglasses on and I was comfortable in this top. Great time. And then here it is on the beach. We finally made it to the beach. And this is me just chilling in the sun in my mock neck with mom on the beach. So great time. And then I also pulled out my Barnsley sweater again a couple days later. We were doing, oh god, the day that we planned to do um, the Path of the Gods, which is a hike in the Amalfi Coast region where you're walking from a town called Bomerano, which not to be confused with the towns of Burano or Murano, but Bomerano. <laughs> you're walking from there to um, Sorrento or, or vice versa. You could walk either way. But so this whole hike is I think like between six and seven kilometers. And the idea is that it's right along kind of the coastal edge. So you have these incredible views of like the cliffside, the ocean, you can see a Sorrento in the distance when you're walking from Bomerano. Like it's just, when you look at travel photos of this hike, it is breathtaking. Um, unfortunately for us, the day that it made sense for us to go um, was was rainy and at first we were like that's fine you know we can put on our rain jackets. What we did not fully grasp the magnitude of was the fog um, and the degree of fog and the way that um, hiking at higher altitude was going to really exacerbate the fog. This day was a struggle on the dressing front where again, wool was the hero. So we started out, you can see I'm in my Barnsley sweater. I've got my polyester shell jacket over top. About half an hour later, we've added the trench coat layer that I thankfully had in my backpack um, because it is raining more than we were led to believe. So the forecast had told us that it was supposed to rain less than a millimeter per hour the entire time really like, oh it's just gonna spit and it's probably not even going to the whole time like you know it's it's fine like we would be silly to call it off over this amount of rain and then it starts like actually raining i'm like okay out comes the trench coat um this is also me laughing hysterically at my sister like thinking about the views that she had in her head that we were going to be seeing and then looking out at what we were actually seeing and like sighing dramatically <laughs> because it was it was very not the same you can see in this picture the amount of fog that was going on like i so much fog we at least had the foresight to bring snacks on this hike but this picture is actually for the purpose of giving a shout out to merino wool gloves obviously i didn't knit these these are like a pretty solid fabric these are from icebreaker but also really appreciated having merino wool gloves on again like a wet cold day like i feel like wet cold is where wool really shines so this was excellent here's my barnsley sweater taking an oreo snack break so as you can see the sun has obviously come out some of the fog is dissipating the views still aren't as clear as they would normally be but we can see more than like the foot in front of our face <laughs> so i've lost the trench coat i've lost the shell jacket barnsley in all its glory here's a barnsley sweater at a sign telling us that we are about 45 minutes from the end of the trail good for us. In case it's not clear like actually how foggy it was, I'm going to pop up a few pictures of what you'll see in travel blogs of what this hike is supposed to look like. Like incredible, beautiful. Look how far you can see. Look at all the stuff. Incredible. Now let me play for you a video that my sister took on our hike. Ta-da! Oh my god. It's such a beautiful view over that way, probably. <laughs> So thankfully it was not all that foggy. There were stretches of it where we could see more and like we absolutely saw some beautiful views. The trail itself is gorgeous because you're just in this like cliffside nature. It's like, it was definitely worth doing regardless, but like in no way was this 
the hike that is like advertised to you as the path of the gods <laughs> like the next day was much warmer and like kind of warmer by enough that it was not ideal so here i'm wearing again my laura delgarde and tarja sweater and i'm wearing it because this is a travel day this is the day that we were taking the train from the amalfi coast to rome where we were going to fly home out of which meant that i had to be wearing one of my two bulkiest sweaters in order to pack my suitcase so that was going to be either my big yellow baba sweater or this sweater. Both of them cannot fit in the suitcase and have everything else still fit. So the morning before we left, I'm wearing this sweater. We're going on a walk to the little market, which spoiler was not open because this is the kind of tiny town where there's one store and it's open like roughly half the time and you never know when it's gonna be open because it's kind of just like whenever the owner woke up and felt like going there that day. <laughs> They're walking to the market in hopes of finding some sort of breakfast that did not happen and I'm like a little bit sweating in this sweater. It was it was not it was not perfect but look how cute a picture this is of this sweater so was it a loss? No. And this is a sweater in the lemon grove that was attached to our house that we were staying in. <laughs> So this is the one day where my knits did not like serve me quite ideally but that was more just a limitation of um needing to wear the bulky sweater for travel purposes so then when we got to rome it was sort of like in between the two climates that we had just been in so we were in rome for a day and a half before we went home it wasn't really on our travel itinerary it was just like well this is where we have to fly out of so we might as well have like a little bit of time to do a couple things while we're here but i absolutely don't feel like i've like seen rome you know that wasn't the goal but we did I mean, we got gelato a billion times, but <laughs> this is one of the times we got it. This was in Rome and the temperature was sort of in between. So this was a day that I wore my squiggle sweater, you can see here, and I chose it for that day without like a shell jacket layer like I had to have in Venice because in Rome it was not sunny the way that it had been in the Amalfi Coast, but it also was not damp and cold and rainy the way that it had been in Venice. So this is a superwash sweater, so it's not as warm as my other wool, so it was kind of a good like in-between choice for this day. And then I also have to include a picture of it in front of the Trevi Fountain because it, like me, got to have its Lizzie McGuire movie moment and who doesn't want that? And here it is while I toss in the coin that I obviously was gonna have to toss into the Trevi Fountain because how could you not? Our next day in Rome was classic rib day again. So you can see that all of these sweaters got like multiple uses throughout the trip. And this is the day we're going to the Colosseum, as you can see. So you can just kind of see it peeking out there at the Colosseum. And here's a better picture of it later in the day when the sun had come out. You could see there was a lot of clouds going on earlier in the day at the Colosseum. So in the afternoon, we found this park for the kids to play at. And again, it's sunny and I'm still very comfortable in my classic rib. Like this garment is proving itself to be really good for those sort of awkward, like in-betweeny weather days where it's kind of unclear what one should be wearing. So it worked really well for me for that. <coughs> oh my God, I'm trying to hydrate and I'm dying. Okay, so that wraps up my like, what I wore in Italy, <laughs> I guess, segment. So I don't know, I think it's just fun sometimes to see how the garments that we knit actually end up playing out in real life. And you know, sometimes we run into the problem where we knit things and then don't actually end up getting a ton of use out of them. So it was really fun to see how actually like critical to the success of this trip these garments ended up being like they were actually all useful i wore every single one of them multiple times and i was really glad that i packed them so it just felt very like wow good for me <laughs> good knitting good job all right hello Allie from the future back here um so that concludes my thoughts about my knits and my trip so thank you so much for watching i hope that you enjoyed this was a little bit different than usual um, but I thought it would be kind of a fun thing to add in. And if you disagree, at least it was just a bonus video. So I hope that I will catch you next time. If you would like, please do like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.